All right, so what is probably one of the better uh, biographies, books, whatever, about Eisenhower and pretty much his whole life? Um, so for this, we're going to look at Eisenhower in War and Peace by Gene Edward Smith. Here's a cover, nice big old close-up of, of Eisenhower. Um, so one of the reasons why I picked this one, not, not just because it's big, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a rather extensive bibliography too. It was about 20 pages. Um, and Smith is also a highly acclaimed biographer, apparently. Has multiple prize winning biographies, uh, has been on faculty for example, uh, the University of Toronto for 35 years, uh, Marshall University for 12, and was a senior scholar at Columbia till he passed away in 2019. Um, you know, basically, well known biographer. Um, that and it was pretty well written, um, and really kind of encompasses a lot of things. One of the things I've noticed not really a side note, but especially with major generals, not the rank, but like um, major American uh, generals and their, their biographies, like I've done Douglas MacArthur before um, as an example, but they tend to, even if they do stuff like a lot of things after they get out of the military, like Eisenhower, for example, they tend to still focus really hard on just that military aspect like for Eisenhower, that would be World War II. But with this book, I think he did, yes, it's a significant chunk, and obviously because Eisenhower was a military man and was, it was the probably the biggest part of his life, but he did a lot of things afterwards that the author actually gave a lot of time for. And um, he didn't, over, I don't want to say overcompensate, but like really drill in on the, on especially World War II for Ike, um, as like other authors tend to, from what I've noticed. But that being said, what is a little bit about Ike, right? So to take a quote, for the majority of Americans, he is a benign fatherly figure looming indistinctly out of the mists of the past, a high-ranking general who directed the Allied armies to victory in Europe, and a caretaker president who presided over eight years of international calm and domestic tranquility. Uh, most would agree he was a man of principle, decency, and common sense, whom the country could count on to do what was right. In both war and peace, he gave the world confidence in American leadership. Um, it goes on to, this is all in the preface, um, so really talking about uh, after World War II, his, how his political know-how kind of really helped him with the National Security Council with people like Dulles, um, and then also taking care of Nixon as a VP, and uh, further on with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and things like that, Vietnam, so on. We'll get into that later, don't worry. Um, but those sorts of things, right? Um, also, he, like he said, because that quote that I gave was literally the very beginning of the preface, um, really kind of pushing on the fatherly figure part and kind of caretaker as like big, um, big words that the author attributes to him. Uh, to finish off his preface, uh, Smith says on April 2nd, 1969 in Abilene, Kansas, Eisenhower was laid to rest in the presence of his family. He was buried in a government issue $80 pine coffin wearing his favorite or his famous Ike jacket with no medals or decorations other than insignia of rank. And so he really, really paints Eisenhower in like, as he names his first chapter, uh, just folks. Um, basically, he's just another guy, even though he did um, all of these things that we'll get into. Not really in this video. I'm thinking about making a series like I did with Douglas MacArthur and going more in depth in my own study as well for the videos. Uh, so there's that. Um, but just to start off with kind of, this one's more supposed to be a general review um, and then we'll break down further in depth later. So to, to start off with, um, Dwight D. Eisenhower was born in Denison, Texas in Octo on October 14th, 1890. Um, he was the third of seven sons born to David and Ida Eisenhower and was the only one uh, born in Texas, 
right? And basically, they, they made their way to uh, Kansas. I'm not going to get too much into that, but born in Texas, um, moved around a lot. Um, we're going to really skip a lot of his childhood part because it's not as a big part of this, not for this video at least. Um, but starting off later, he was born, again, he was born in um, October of... 1890 right so skipping ahead to the summer of 1910 this is when ike was trying to get into a military academy so he had a basically a high school friend and just we're just going to call him swede for these purposes but in the course of the summer of 1910 uh swede convinced ike that the service academies offered the best ticket out of abilene basically a small town in kansas lots of corn and corn and corn um <laughs> So it was not difficult to persuade me um, this was a good move, Eisenhower wrote later. There is no evidence he fretted about his parents' pacifist convictions. To the contrary, he worked diligently that summer to secure an appointment. His first choice was to accompany Swede to Annapolis, and if that were not possible, to go to West Point. So basically, um, he ended up lying about his age. Uh, because there was a maximum age of 19 for the Naval Academy at the time and 22 for West Point. And so he lied basically just saying he was 18 um, for both of them, even though he didn't have to for West Point. But basically he ended up taking a test, um, kind of si very similar to what happened with Mac Douglas MacArthur to get into West Point, where basically like the senator um, of a state basically had a bunch of in this, in Eisenhower's case, uh, eight boys take an interest exam and then ranked them based off of that and gave out appointments. Uh, so this was on October 4th, so like right before his birthday. Um, after a grueling two days, the grades were tallied and Eisenhower finished second overall, the first among those who indicated they would accept either appointment. They split them between, um, basically, if you would choose either Annapolis or West Point or just one or the other um, for the preference. But anyways, uh, he got it, So obviously. So um, armed with a senatorial appointment, Ike cleared the final hurdle on January 13th, 1911, when he passed the West Point entrance exam and physical at Jefferson Barracks in Missouri. And he would join the class of 1915, which we'll eventually learn is the class the stars fell upon. Um, or at least that's what... I think I highlighted a part of the stats. No, it's the next part. I always get ahead of my notes whenever I'm talking. But anyways, so for specifics of what I just said, uh, the class of 1915 was called upon in World War II, um, and it met the challenge. Of the 115 men still on active duty, 60 became general officers. Um, besides Eisenhower and Bradley, um, Omar Bradley, um, who became five-star generals of the Army. They were two full generals, those two, seven lieutenant generals, three stars, uh, 24 major generals, 15 of whom commanded divisions in combat, which is their two stars, um, and 25 brigadier generals, which is a single star. And that's why they named it, especially since over half of the people in that class literally became general officers. Uh, they named it the class the stars fell on. So there's that. Um, after that, he really gets into World War One, which for Eisenhower wasn't very active. Um, unfortunately for him, he was not happy about it at all. Um, but basically, he got into the tank corps. There was a bunch of stuff about how, like, because he, he had a health issue um, that is eluding me at the moment. But basically, he didn't go infantry at first, and he went in, into the tank corps first. Um, and then he went into Camp Colt in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, um, to basically head the, tra uh, the head the tank corps, um, and more basic. But the problem was they didn't have any tanks, and so they just did what they could on old battlefields of Gettysburg. And he talks about this in his book as well. Um, and he finally gets deployed to go over to France in World War One, and he arrives um, in the beginning of November. Yeah, the, yeah, Ike and Mamie, his wife, said goodbye on November 10th, 1918, and then at 5.15 a.m. November 11th, 
Um, the Germans signed the armistice agreement and the guns would go silent at 11 a.m. Uh, that would be the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Eisenhower was sitting in the hes in hit. Wow, I can't talk today. Eisenhower was sitting in his headquarters with his classmate Major Norman Randolph when the news was announced. I suppose we'll spend the rest of our lives explaining why we didn't get into this war. And again, at this time, um, uh, Eisenhower was already a major, and um, he still got a, a DSM, Distinguished Service Medal basically for, and I quote, while commanding officer of the Tank Corps Training Center, uh, he displayed unusual zeal, foresight, and marked administrative ability in the organization training and preparation for overseas service of the Tank Corps. This is something you see a lot, um, or I've noticed, even with a bunch of like uh, Ike's peers and so on, uh, especially ret retroactively, no. Uh, looking back in the past, kind of, um, of, say, like, uh, Montgomery on the British side, and I believe Patton says something similar as well, but basically, like, Eisenhower couldn't command troops worth anything, because he never really had much experience as tro uh, for troop duty, but he was a great administrator, and so something that um, is attributed, attributed to him, especially later in the book, is how well he was at the theater command part. Um, and really doing the, like, he wasn't great on the ground commanding troops. He was great synthesizing the whole big picture of the theater itself. Um, get into more specifics in that later, right? Um, so after this, um, he went to, uh, well, a few years later, uh, he went to gen command and general staff school, June in 1926. He won highest in the class. He had help. Uh, I think he borrowed, uh, no, he wasn't a general at the time, but George Patton's notes uh, for that school, and it helped him significantly. And that's one thing, because um, they were both very, Patton and Eisenhower were pretty close, especially because they were both tank guys. Um, and they both got in trouble for being tank guys later on. Um, but that's a bit of a side note, right? Uh, later on, after that, pretty much directly, he went to War College. He had a letter of commendation from Pershing. Um, so there's that. Not get ahead of myself again. But yeah, basically t saying how good he was. Um, to take a quote on this, um, one of the things you notice a lot in the author of the book talks about a lot is the fact that um, Eisenhower had a lot of help in his career. He had a lot of kind of, how do I want to word this? He had a lot of higher up officers who really liked him and definitely kind of used their not necessarily just rank, but their um, I don't know, their influence to help him a lot. A lot of the times, uh, multiple times actually, talks about Fox Connor um, was one that helps him a lot. In this case, Pershing is added to that list. And there's another one later that we'll get into. Um, I believe I made a note of it in the book. So there's that. Um, and he was always being fought, uh, fought over right, um, for multiple positions pretty much all the time, and that isn't too helpful when, especially when he gets under, uh, MacArthur. Um, get into that later, though. So, pretty much, um, at this time, we're talking about, about, um, August of 1927 was when his commission at the, or his assignment with the Battle Monuments Commission ended, um, and this is when he got his commendation letter from Pershing, um, and this letter, as he says, established a watershed in Eisenhower's career. Before that, he was merely a gifted protege of Fox Connors, still subject to whatever roughhouse the infantry establishment might choose to inflict. Excuse me. After Pershing's commendation, he was admitted to the ranks of the chosen few. And this basically helped him go pretty much directly to the, uh, the war college while skipping... Um, somewhere else that made a note on earlier or i guess later is what i mean to say uh, right here so on november 21st 1930 um this might not be what i'm thinking of 
nope, got ahead of myself again. Well, it happens, whatever. But one of the things I really wanted to do, because it was an interest point for me where Eisenhower pretty much became um, <clears throat> dang, MacArthur's uh, assistant, um, aide-de-camp type thing, um, is how that kind of came to be. Right, so on November 21st, 1930, uh, Douglas MacArthur seceded um, Charles Summerall as Army's Chief of Staff, and a wave of change swept through the War Department. George Mosley um, became MacArthur's Deputy Chief of Staff, which basically at this time, um, Eisenhower was under Mosley. Um, this is kind of how he got shuffled in there. And within a year, all the principal general staff officers had been replaced. MacArthur had come to the War Department from the Philippines, and his first impression was that the Army staff divisions were entirely too self-contained. As MacArthur's deputy, Mosley presided over the Army general staff and coordinated its functions, and Eisenhower came with him. So this really kind of was where Eisenhower first got shooed into the War Department in Washington, sort of thing. And from there... Pretty much. Uh, <clears throat> God, sorry for the coffin. Throat's real scratchy for some reason. Anyways, um, that's how he Eisenhower got into the War Department for the most part. And then after his time was ending, uh, his his term, I think it's like it's three or four years for for them at this time. But anyways, basically, Mark MacArthur came up to him and gave him an ultimatum. Uh, and pretty much took them for the most part. So to take a letter from him specifically, this was a diary entry actually, if it, I believe, for, from Ike about MacArthur. So on Saturday, General MacArthur called me to his office for a short conference relative to my prospective transfer. He called attention to the fact that though I would be due for duty with troops this summer, I will not have completed a four-year detail in this city until September of 1933. He suggested that he suggested that I stay here for four years, gave me until Friday, um, which was February 15th, 1932 at this point, uh, to think it over and also informed me that at the end of the four-year detail, he would give me Fort Washington to command. And then basically it was like, it's the greatest compliment to have a general set. Basically he wants you to stick around. Um, so there's that. Um, to continue on, um, basically he just told him, okay, I'll stay. And then MacArthur moved quickly to take advantage of Eisenhower's talent. Ike was installed in an office between Mosley and the chief of staff with direct access to both. He remained on the army's rolls as an assistant to Secretary Payne, but for all practical purposes, he became MacArthur's military secretary. Wow. When Payne left the government in March 1933, Eisenhower was officially transferred to the chief of staff's office, but was never given a job title. So there's that. Now we're going to start pushing through this book because I kind of like to stay more towards the front. But... So there's those. Um, it's how he kind of got with MacArthur, right? And then went with MacArthur to uh, the Philippines in the beginning, and then he eventually came back, and this time with Marshall, when he came back to Washington, right? And this is leading up into World War II. This is after he had the Louisiana um, maneuvers and so on. Um, and basically, Eisenhower was coming back to lead the War Plans Division. And so, to take a quote, uh, it was in Louisiana that Marshall first began to consider Ike as a possible chief of the Army's war plan division. Toward the end of the Louisiana maneuvers, General Walter Kruger recalled General Marshall asked me whom I regarded as best fitted to head the war plans division, which I had headed several years before, and I named Eisenhower, though I was loath to lose him. Uh, but before turning over the plan, the, the war plans division to Ike, basically, uh, Marshall wanted to, uh, test him basically and gave him like a scenario, um, for the Pacific specifically. And was like, this is what 
things are looking like in the Pacific right now, like what do you think we should do? And made him answer. So there's that. Um, and then more or less this war plans division position that he that he got um, basically kind of led him into the theater commander role for Torch, which was the Allied invasion of North Africa in 1942. Um, so there's that, and now we're really starting to get into World War II for the book. Um, like like the comment I said earlier, like they um, Gene Smith really didn't like overemphasize World War II for this book. Like, you don't really start getting into this until you're almost at page 300, and it's a 700-something page book. Um, so there's that. One of the things, 16, if I could flip to the right page. Um, other highlights. Uh, so after Torch, um, we know he, he basically came to Command Overlord as well for the Allied invasion, opening another front in the European theater. For that, um, and Smith attributes about 100 pages to World War II in this book, period. Um, to take a quote, uh, this was the, uh, let's see, the official decision to make Eisenhower the commander for Overlord. Basically, at the Tehran conference, Stalin was like, Stalin basically asked FDR, like, specifically, like, who's it going to be? Tried to, like, really corner him a lot um to give him an actual name he literally said who will command overlord according to the quote um roosevelt later said that old bolshevik is trying to force me to give him a name and uh but i can't tell him because i haven't made up my mind because fdr still hadn't made a decision uh later on um to take a quote so when it ended the conference ended on december 2nd 1943 fdr had still not reached a decision basically between marshall and eisenhower um he recognized marshall was entitled to the post and understood his obligation to the chief of staff but he had increasingly come to believe that eisenhower might be a better choice and he was truly reluctant to lose marshall from washington and basically he asked Marshall what he wanted, if Marshall actually wanted the position. And of course, Marshall being that high up for so long, knows how that kind of, to play that a bit and was like, and he told the president, I will wholeheartedly accept whatever decision the president makes. Um, and in his own diaries, Marshall says, I was determined that I should not embarrass the president one way or the other, that he must be able to deal in this matter with a perfectly free hand and whatever he felt was the best interest of the country, not just because he owed him in a way, if that makes sense. Um, and then he said, evidently it was left up to me, Marshall recalled, uh, I repeated again in as convincing language as I could that I wanted him to feel free to act in whatever way he felt was best in the best interest, interest of the country and to his satisfaction and not in any way to consider my feelings being Marshall. And then Rosenfeld chose Eisenhower and then said, told Marshall that he basically couldn't sleep at night with him out of the country. So there's that. Um, that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about for World War II with Eisenhower. Um, like I said, this is already going on 23 minutes, and I'm trying to talk faster so that it goes fast-ish. But these bigger reviews, I want to kind of... I don't mind them being big and blocky, because whatever. Um, but basically, after World War II, um, Eisenhower becomes chief of staff. Then he becomes uh, the 13th president of Columbia University. Um, but basically leading up into Korea, he got pulled a bunch of different directions and, um, he was the president, but like, wasn't really acting that much at the time because he kept getting pulled into Washington for advisory roles and so on. Um, and then basically just kind of pushed it off, uh, meaning the, um, Colombian, the uh, University of Columbia fucking whoops anyways um it doesn't matter these aren't uh monetized anyway especially since I'm getting a little bit of a brain fart hopefully it's pretty quiet anyways we're getting into NATO so this is uh December 19th 1950 um 
that's when Ike made NATO's first supreme, supreme allied commander, Europe. Um, and then there's that. Uh, the, in terms of NATO, the biographer really says Ike was NATO and NATO was Ike. Um, during his first year in Europe, Eisenhower traveled tirelessly from capital to capital, assuring his listeners that the United States was their par partner, um, but that in the end, Europe would have to be defended by Europeans. Um, kind of a note on his policy on that as well. Uh, and then July of 1952, Eisenhower grabs Nixon as his running mate. Um, and then he talks briefly about um, the decisions and roles that Eisenhower played in Vietnam, the Suez Crisis, and then also the Little Rock Nine, um, if you remember that from your high school history. But also... Um, an interesting fact of whenever Eisenhower, after Eisenhower had his uh, his heart attack and so on, um, and his health health was really deteriorating, he uh, asked uh, JFK, who was president at the time, to restore his five star rank so he's no longer Mr. President, um, which confused JFK at first until one of the generals that JFK had that. I wrote somewhere, but here it is. Who was he talking to? Brigadier General Ted Clifton was the one who explained it to Kennedy that basically Eisenhower was a military man at heart, to take a quote. And then pretty much uh, the, the name or term General of the Army was an independent title, something I could work for all his life. Um, and then basically it also kind of kept him separate from the role in Washington. But... With that being said, that's kind of all I have to say on this for now. Um, I think I'm just going to leave it. Leave it there. Yeah, he wrote his presidential memoirs at that time, too, closer to the end of his life, and so on. But anyways, here's going to be the cover for that again. Maybe if I could show the whole book, it would matter. But anyways, like as you could probably hear, it's, it's a thick boy. For, for sure, but, uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this one, it was well written, uh, there's an extensive list of sources, um, to look into further, uh, the chapters aren't too long too, it's broken up very easy and easy to, easy to digest, um, in that way, but with that being said, let me know if you guys want me to go more specific into specific topics, or further in depth, um, I don't mind doing rabbit holes. Um, I really like this one, so I'm probably gonna, going to do like a, a longer playlist like I did with MacArthur anyway. I noticed like doing that like really helps uh, solidify a lot of the a lot of the content into long-term memory for me. So that's been extremely helpful um, now, even just like making decisions in real life anyway. but Anyways, not the here nor there. As always, um, link to playlist or card to playlist in the corner. Um, I always put a link to the books and sources in the description so you guys can find them easy. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to leave this one here. Feel free to comment uh, as well if specific things you want me to go into further or tell me how terrible terrible of a job I did doesn't really matter to me so either way this stuff is actually a thoroughly good learning experience for me as well so i've been enjoying it anyways i'll leave this one here and see you guys on the next one